welcome to our webinar this evening. I am just letting everybody in as normal. This is going to be an extremely busy um, webinar. Um, the people doing the webinar, if you can unmute yourselves, just so that I know that you're all in, okay. You, if you can just please be patient with me, we do have lots and lots joining. I think this is gonna be one of the most busiest webinars we've ever done. Um, so I am just more trying to make sure I have let everybody in. Um, when we start, I'm going to make Emma the host. Emma, will you be able to continue to let people in at that point? Great, okay. Um, so welcome everybody to this evening's call. Like I said, it is going to be very, very busy. We are going to make sure we go through quite a lot with you. There is going to be a point of questions and answers. And when you're being asked anything, if you can put your answers in the chat, the chat set is all set up so that it functions for everybody. And then the three ladies doing the webinar can uh, go through it. So the featured experts that you have this evening are Emma Stevens, Claire Denia, and Samantha Thornycroft Taylor. I'm sure you all know them really, really well by now. Um, and I wanna make sure that we give our thanks right at the beginning and at the end, because as I said, corrections is one of those topics where people find it a little bit taboo. The reason we wanted to do this webinar is we think there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding of what, um, what it even means. So I'm going to let the featured experts talk you through it because I asked them to do it simply because I'm just as baffled as the rest of you are, okay? I don't know whether I should be correcting my dog, should I shouldn't be correcting my dog, am I a bad owner if I correct my dog? I'm, I'm very, very, very confused. So these ladies are going to put things in perspective for us. Um, Emma, if I can hand over to you to get started um, and uh, if you can just keep on admitting people for me, please. Fine. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, okay, so welcome everybody um, to this uh, webinar that we're going to do on the science behind corrections. Um, this webinar is not designed to tell you how to train, um, but instead we're going to give you the science behind all the methods to allow you to pick appropriate training tools, equipment and methods that you feel confident and comfortable using, teaching and using in a correction. Um, that will work for the dog that's in front of you. Um, I'll hand over to Claire to talk a bit more about the dog that's in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, dogs all have different temperaments. And as Em just touched on, what we're not here to do is advise individual people on how to correct their dog. Um, as trainers, we work with the individual dog and owner in front of us all the time, taking into considering the dog's temperament, um, personality, whether they're sensitive dogs, and also what the owner is confident in and comfortable using as well. Um, and what, what works for one dog and what one dog may deem a correction may not be a correction for another dog at all, which we're going to come on to much later on the webinar. Um, but this is really just to give you an overview and understanding of what we're talking about when we use the word correction and the science behind that. Oh, thank you. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, we're going to ask you guys a question. So if you can open the chat box um, and make sure that it's to everybody um, so that we can see it. We'd really like to know what you think correction actually means. Um, and this will help us then kind of go on to different parts of it. So if we give everybody just a couple of minutes just to um, write back what they think correction means. So we've got redirection, giving the dog an indicator that they've not done what you've asked. Um, letting your dog, sorry, I've just drawn on this screen. <laughs> um, <laughs> a consequence, pointing out to your dog when a behavior is not expected quietly. Um, an interruption. Oh God, these are great. These are coming in really quickly. Hang on, let me go back and try and... Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, if I've missed any, I'm really sorry. Um, stopping a dog <laughs> doing something you don't want them to, a consequence, an interruption to something that the dog is already doing, resetting the dog and trying again, communicating with the, your dog. Um, the dog has not done what you expected and you try to correct. These are great guys. These are brilliant. Thank you. Um, correction for me feels like part of the learning process. So when I correct, I'm basically 
feeding back some when something's gone wrong. If anybody else is can everybody mute themselves please when if they're just joining that would be great thank you so yeah these are brilliant guys uh removing the rewards the uh the dog expects for its behavior making it clear what they are that what they are doing is what you don't want them to do and trying to teach them what you do want okay brilliant so um the Google definition or a dictionary definition is the act of making something accurate or better that is a change to fix a mistake or punishment to correct a fault, which means that the English language of the term correction is actually built around both nice and aversive ways of correction. Obviously, as trainers, we try to we strive to be as nice as, as possible to the dogs. Um, but as Claire said, what one dog finds nice, another dog may find aversive. So it's really important to know the science behind a correction so that you can make the right decision for the dog that's in front of you um, and not just think, right, OK, treats are really nice. So therefore, I'm going to use them for everything when actually one dog might not like treats and you might have to think of a different method of, of rewarding them um, to correct to correct them nicely. Um, so the terms that we're going to use tonight are nice and aversive. Um, when we're talking about something that is actually a consequence to the dog, um, we're not going to use positive and negative because we'll come on to that later that they actually mean two completely separate things. OK, so nice and aversive is is when it is either nice to the dog. So they have a pleasant experience or aversive to the dog. So they have a not so pleasant experience. Um, so a correction is now um, socially a, a, an accepted term that usually means aversive. When most people think of correction, most people think of something that they're going to cause harm or pain or suffering to the dog. And it doesn't have to be. Um, so correction should also only be used if the dog fully understands that the behavior that's being asked of it. Um, and this brings us on really nicely to teaching versus training. So again, they're two different terms. Um, and it's really important that when you are training and teaching, you're very aware of the difference between the terms. So teaching is engagement with learners to enable understanding application of knowledge, concepts and processes. So it's teaching a new behavior that the dog is currently unaware of. So it means you can't correct them because they don't actually know what's right or wrong yet because it's a new behavior that's being learned, okay? The methods that are commonly used, luring and shaping, and we'll come on to them in a little bit. Um, but again, a question, when does luring stop being necessary and turn actually into what we call bribery instead, which again, we're gonna come on to in the next slide as well. Versus training. So training is developing specific and useful knowledge skills and techniques. And the key word here is develop. So it means they're already aware of it and you're just furthering the dog's knowledge and education on that. So it could be the dog knows how to retrieve. So you start doing memory retrieves or blind retrieves or you start building up the distance of scene retrieves. Um, and that's developing that specific knowledge. And that's where you can use correction um, and also methods of shaping and reward as well. If the dog doesn't necessarily do it right, there are multiple avenues that we can go down to make that exercise maybe easier because you've challenged them too much or correct them and, and shape them into, into succeeding and doing the right thing. So it's building on existing known behaviors and checking understanding as well. So you're always constantly checking that the dog actually is understanding so that you can build on those behaviors and make them better. So bribery, luring and shaping. So I will hand you over to Claire to talk about bribery. Yeah. <laughs> so um, those people that know me well or watch my videos of me training my dogs, I use food when I train my dogs a lot. Uh, one of my dogs is extremely motivated and one mm, could take it or leave it and one is not food motivated at all. But one of the common things that um, we see is when we've gone through the process of teaching a dog is not removing the lure quick enough. And I know Emma and Sam are going to talk about these bits in depth in a minute. Um, but what we end up seeing is a lot of cases where the dog will not offer the behavior unless the owner is holding the treat or the reward, whatever that would be, a tennis ball in front of the dog. But the dog has learnt the behaviour, they've learnt the thing that we're, we're teaching them, but they refuse to do it unless there's something on show. So that's bribing the dog. Um, now, the problem with bribes is that they will only work, usually, when the bribery 
at, is not outweighed by the other options available to the dog. So if, for instance, you're using a treat and the dog fully understands what the word sit means and can sit and does sit, and you've proofed that sit, but the dog refuses to sit unless you're holding a treat under its nose, um, then you're bribing the dog. But if the other options available to the dog, maybe chasing a squirrel or chasing a rabbit, <laughs> outweigh that treat, then that bribery is going to fail you. So for me, you know, it's knowing whether you, you have trained the dog and you've proofed that training and are you now trying to bribe the dog to get the result as opposed to it being a trained response. Is that enough, Em? Happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so luring, and um, Sam's going to talk about luring because um, she's, she's just done a masterclass on it as well where it covers it. So that's what she's going to talk about. Thanks, Em. So, yeah, as, um, as you sort of touched upon on the last slide, we tend to use luring when we're teaching a new behaviour. So a behaviour that the dog hasn't yet learnt. Um, and we can use a treat in order to lure the dog into the correct position or to give us the correct um, behaviour. So, for example, heel work, you would have the treat down, but you would... Uh, use the lure to get the dog into the correct position, reward it for being in the correct position, and then you can sort of further it. So you move beyond position to moving on. So you could flood feed, lure with treats as you're walking along and keeping the dog in that correct position. For things like sit, you would more commonly pair the treat with the hand signal and then ultimately the verbal command as well. But for me, luring in the beginning, you don't necessarily give them that verbal command. They haven't learnt it. So we're teaching them the behaviour, the action that we want by use of a treat and then making sure that we remove that treat soon enough that it doesn't become the bribe that Claire just spoke about. Is that all right, Em? Yeah. Um, the only other one that we've given an example for, because it's quite an easy one for people to visualise, is a spin. And this is where you really understand whether your dog's being lured or being bribed. Um, because a spin is your hand eventually. So your hand signal would be doing that to make them spin or, or like wrap that by their nose, basically. So you pair the treat with the body language to start with then you add the verbal cue and then when you remove the treat the hand signal still does the same thing with the verbal cue and then you can you can mess about with the verbal cue and taking the hand signals away and just having the verbal cue and things like that but that's one that's really easy to visualize and test whether your dogs actually are being bribed or actually do value the reward that comes after the, the behavior and that's when you start seeing am I bribing my dog am I luring them and they just still don't understand it yet um or are they waiting for and, and can they wait for that treat to actually be delivered or that reward to be delivered um the other method that we talk about is shaping so this is a series of steps to teach a new behavior um by segmenting them into small steps um so that your dog feels successful the whole way through um the way that the idea is, is that you have a lack of vocal command. So the dog actually offers behavior. And we talk about offering behavior quite a lot, um, especially in gun dogs, because obviously we want them to choose to behave. We want them to, to choose to do the right thing, especially when they're put in environments that are so stimulating for them. We want them to choose to go for that retrieve in a field full of sheep. We want them to choose to pick the runner over the static birds on the floor. We want them to choose to sit steady with birds falling all around them. And we want them to choose to sit to flush when, when birds get up off the ground um, in a beating line um, and not necessarily have a constant verbal command offering a wait or a stop to flush if you can't see them and things like that. So it's a lot of shaping to, goes from very, very small stuff all the way through their training up to quite advanced gun dog work is, is making sure that they're choosing to do the right thing all the time. Um, so owners need to be quick and consistent with a reward, um, and, and mark the behavior at the right time, um, for shaping to work. That's the biggest thing with it. Um, a couple of examples of it is, um, doorways, crates and car, um, and food. So the way I shape, um, food, um, is a bowl of food would be lowered. Um, if a dog presents in a sit, 
if they stop presenting the sit and they get up or they try and jump at me, the food comes back up again. And they learn very, very quickly if you're consistent and you reward the desirable behavior at the right time, that a sit means food comes down and moving means that food comes back up again. You can then translate that all the way through to your stop whistle. Once you've taught a stop whistle, you can shape a stop whistle um, or a stop to flush or a stop to shot and things like that by the minute the dog has paired a stop to a movement they will then choose to stop to movement because the reward is more desirable than the chase. Um, so there's just a few ways of, of teaching dogs and obviously making sure that you're not going into this bribery aspect, different rewards work for different dogs. Um, and that's what we're going to touch into in a minute as well. Um, so it's not just, you can't, you don't just bribe with food. You can bribe with toys. You can, you can bribe with all sorts of things. Um, and it's just making sure that you don't run the risk of going into that kind of bribery aspect, but, but luring and shaping are very nice ways because obviously we're not talking about positive because that means something different. They're very nice ways to train, to train dogs, um, and they're the ways that are commonly used um, and becoming more and more commonly used as well. So um, another thing that we're going to delve into is the quadrants of training. Um, and these science terms um, are going to factor basically what we talk about tonight as well. So lots of you will have heard of these before, positive reinforcement, positive punishment, negative reinforcement and negative punishment. Um, what we're going to do tonight is show you that actually there are nice and aversive methods of every single quadrant. You could be a very nice R plus trainer, or you could also be quite an aversive R plus trainer, depending on how you use the equipment and how you introduce it to the dog. Um, and that's that's the key bit message that the three of us tonight kind of wanted to get across to everybody is that all four of these quadrants can work together separately um, and for individual dogs if you choose the nicer versions of them rather than the aversive versions of them. Um, so what do the words mean? Um, so this is why we're not using positive and negative tonight, because positive means adding. So it means adding something. Negative means removing something. So your ad could be the addition of a treat or the addition of body language or the addition of a piece of equipment that could be aversive or nice. Um, negative is the removal of it. So the removal of pressure, the removal of food, um, the removal of a dog out of, out of a certain environment, that, that's negative. Uh, reinforcement is to increase the behavior. So you're adding something or removing something to increase the behavior. Your punishment is the opposite. So you're again, going to add something or remove something to decrease the behavior. Now, what we've done is we've gone through positive reinforcement, positive punishment, negative reinforcement, negative punishment in detail with examples so that everybody can kind of see them working in a realistic environment as well. So Negative and punishment in behavior terms does not mean causing pain, harm, or suffering to the dog. Okay. They're not the words that scientifically a behaviorist would use. Um, aversive means causing harm, pain, and suffering. Negative does not and punishment does not. Okay. So that's a real key bit to take away from, from the webinar tonight is when actually people are talking about negative punishment or negative reinforcement, they're talking about adding something or removing something to increase or decrease a behavior. Okay. So examples. So positive reinforcement. So this is adding something to increase a behavior. Um, so we've, the green ones are nice ones. Um, so we've got two nice ones there. So rewarding a dog when it recalls. So you add the reward to increase the dog's behavior and likelihood to recall in the future. Reward a dog when it's told to sit, you're adding the reward to increase the dog's behavior to sit. So it offers the behavior again, or it does the behavior again when it's asked to. A not so nice one, so an aversive one, is a scruff to a, of a dog to make them steadier. So when you throw something, you scruff your dog to hold it in position. So the addition bit is your body language. So you're adding the scruff, the physical contact on the dog to increase a dog's steadiness, okay? So that again, you can manipulate your training methods to actually cover positive reinforcement, which not a lot of people are necessarily aware of. Again, what is a reward? We've touched on reward a few times. So um, these are some of the examples that we've come up with. So food, toys, physical praise, verbal praise, release or freedom, 
Um, and then retrieving and hunting as well can be used um, more for, for obviously gun dogs um, as, their, as their reward. So positive punishment. Claire, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so with positive punishment, um, we're adding something to decrease the behaviour. So we came up with a couple of nice ones <laughs> and we came up with one not so nice one, so an aversive one. So we said that you could uh, add a long training line for the recall. So by adding the long line, we're decreasing the lack of the recall with the dog. Okay, so a long line is adding something to decrease, decrease the, the dog being able to not recall. Um, the owner retrieving a dog when they don't listen. So um, very similar to when we talked just now about using your own body language to reduce the dog's ability to self-reward. So going to get the dog when they don't recall. Um, so that's us adding in ourselves, going out and getting the dog to reduce the likelihood of them ignoring the recall again. And then our not so nice one, um, and it's not a nice one, ear pulling <laughs> to make a dog be quiet. Um, so, you know, you might find that um, some trainers might find that it's okay to pull the dog's ear um, to actually reduce the dog making a noise okay so if they're in an exciting environment rather than walking the dog away or something like that they might add in actually an ear pull to uh make the dog be quiet to reduce the noise that the dog is offering i just want to add while we're explaining these these are just examples that the three of us came up with um yeah. then examples that we necessarily use advocate promote or anything like that they're just oh. examples so that you guys can understand the four quadrants effectively and that they can be used in a nice way or they can be manipulated into a more aversive way of training as well. Yes. Uh, Sam, do you want to do negative reinforcement? Yep. So uh, negative reinforcement then is the removal of something to increase the behavior. So just to go over what we've said before, in this scenario, negative does not mean something bad. It literally just means taking something away. So we've again come up with two nice examples of what could be negative reinforcement. So we've got the removal of a bowl of food when a dog breaks from a sit position. So we want the dog to remain in its sit while we put its food bowl down until we release it to eat its food, for example. If the dog comes away from the sit, if it stands up, if it dives into its food and we take that food away, taking the food away is the negative and then the reinforcement there is to increase the behavior of the dog staying in a sit. We've also got um, picking up a retrieve by hand if a dog runs in. So if we want our dog to be steady on that retrieve and when we've thrown the retrieve or placed the dummy out, the dog then runs in before we've sent it. If we pick it up by ourselves, then we're, the negative bit is the removal of the retrieve to help the dog understand, to help it increase its steadiness. When you wait, when you sit patiently, when I've asked you to, then you are going to get your reward of your retrieve. Um, and then we've also got a aversive one as well, which would be the removal of pressure of a prong collar when a dog is calmly at heel. So prong collars are used still in various parts of the world, um, but the removal of the pressure would be the negative, the taking away, to then increase the frequency of the calm heel work. So that's then the reinforcement. Um. Thank you. So again, just to make everybody aware, we're not promoting any of these methods or anything like that. It, they are just examples for you to, to think about when thinking about the, the methods of training. Um, so negative punishment is the removal of something to decrease a behavior. Um, so the two nice examples that we've got of this is ignoring a dog uh, by removing a reward when it makes a noise. Um, you remove the contact and that decreases the noise. Um, putting the lead away if a dog jumps up at you. So I know in the dog and duck, we've spoken about lots of dogs getting very excited when the lead comes out. If you put the lead back away and the dog calms back down, the idea is, is that removal of the equipment of the equipment decreases the excitement. You bring it back out eventually. It will swap over into another quadrant because you'll bring the lead out and the dog will remain calm. 
uh, the not so nice month one and one again that is is still commonly used in the UK and uh, and across the world as well um, unfortunately is so the removal of a mouth clamp to decrease the dropping of a dummy so the way a mouth clamp works is that you would put pressure around the dog's nose to hold them holding a dummy so they've got the dummy in the mouth you hold their nose closed um, until they hold the dummy sufficiently and then you remove the pressure to increase the duration of the hold okay and again just because these ex these examples are on here does not mean that we we commonly use them they're just examples for you to to rack your brain around and have a think about so back at, um so what are we then going to talk about is interrupters again so again an interrupter is a, another method of correction and you can have aversive interrupters and nice interrupters as well so what we again want you guys to do is a little bit of audience participation and tell us whether you feel that these interrupters are nice or aversive okay so bird noise i'm just going to bring the chat box back up so that i can hear so a bird noise so commonly used when you throw a dummy around so people make a that kind of noise um but lots of people will also use it as an interrupter if a dog runs out on something and you want them to actually turn around and focus on you they'll make that noise because obviously they're anticipating that it's been paired with a retrieve in the past so nice or aversive go 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 <laughs> <laughs> we're getting lots of nice not lots of nice yeah <laughs> Okay, how about if I told you... A game show. <laughs> it depends on the dog. Okay, brilliant. That's great. Okay, so now if I told you that actually every time I made that bird noise, I was going to hit my dog on the nose. Now, do you think that that interrupter is nice or aversive? So same noise, just different paired. Okay, fab, this is really what we want. So aversive, yeah, brilliant. I'm not going to hit my dog, by the way, <laughs> just, just to put that out there. <laughs> um, okay, brilliant, aversive, fab. Okay, um, right, start a pistol. Go. <laughs> go, guys, go. Nice, depends on the dog, yeah. depends. Yeah. Okay, good, nice. Okay, depends on the dog, depends on the dog, depends on the dog. Okay, we're starting to get, same before. Brilliant, okay. We're starting to get people understanding so again a starter pistol if i've always paired a starter pistol with a retrieve and my dog loves a retrieve 100 percent, that's a lovely interrupter if i if my dog goes off self-hunting and i let a shot off it's going to come running back to me because it thinks it's getting a retrieve um but we all know i had a gun shy dog that starter pistol not being paired with a retrieve and being paired with something that happened to him before i had him 100 percent was was a negative for was a was an aversive for him um so again yeah depends on the dog uh squeaking noise so uh um i don't even have to make a squeaking noise somebody else make a squeaking noise <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so my dog's just come over she thinks it's nice <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, brilliant. Okay, guys are starting to say depends on what it's paired with. So again, you can have very, very noise sensitive dogs and a squeak could be the most terrifying noise to them in the world. Or it can be something that's, um, I mean, if you make a squeaking noise to my terriers, um, they think it's a rat and they go absolutely ballistic. Um, so yeah, 100%, it depends on the dog, the situation. Lots of dogs find it a very exciting noise. But again, some very noise sensitive dogs can find it very aversive as well. Um, or ah ah, or a verbal interrupter. So ah ah, or oi, or something like that. Go. <laughs> 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 uh, aversive for my dog, aversive for my dog, aversive for my dog, aversive, 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 neutral, aversive, aversive. Works for mine, both again. Depends, some words on, some words aren't. Okay, fab. Um, so again, a verbal interrupter is um, very, very commonly used um, across all training, gun dogs and, um, and, dog, and in the dog sports world as well. Um, Sam, do you want to talk about a verbal interrupter very quickly? Uh, yeah, happy to. Sorry, just let me get rid of that bit. So, um, so I will in theory you well i do use interrupters quite frequently because i think you can use them both when you're initially training something but you can also treat, use them to 
interrupt a behavior that's not what you want. So if I'm teaching recall to a really young puppy, for example, and the puppy has lost focus on me, it's having a bit of a sniff around, it's not too far away, and I want to recall it, but it doesn't yet know the recall command, then I will use something like a brrr or a tss just to get that puppy to look at me. So I've interrupted what it's doing. And then when it's looking at me, I can then use nice uh, inviting body language. I can crouch down and then recall the puppy when it's on its way back to me. I can also use it if I know a dog knows what I'm asking of it. If I've sent it on a retrieve, for example, but for whatever reason, it's taken the wrong line, I can use something like an ah uh -uh, which in that sense basically just means, Ahem, excuse me, that wasn't what I was asking of you or come on now think about this. And then again, I can change my body language once I've got that dog's focus back on me. I can either bring it back to me and set it up and start again, or I can change or adapt what it's doing, adapt what it was doing that I needed to interrupt in the first place. So for me, definitely interrupters, verbal interrupters can be nice or reversive, depending on the situation, the scenario and the dog in front of you. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, some dogs, if you went at, at to them, they'd crawl across the ground on their belly to you. Yeah. Some dogs wouldn't even take two notices of you at all. They'd carry on doing what they were doing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, verbal interrupters, they're always the one that kind of we've had a lot, we had a lot more there go more aversive than actually depends on the dog. So, but a hundred percent, it's still your, any of your interrupters will depend on, on a dog um, and how you've then paired them and what's come after the at, at or oi. If you've gone at, at and chased your dog down, grabbed it by the scruff and dragged it back a hundred percent, the next time that at, at happens, it's probably going to kind of crouch down and, and show some submissive body language. But if you've gone at, at, the dog's looked at you and you've turned your body language into very nice, inviting, come back to me and we're going to try again behavior, um, the dog is more likely to listen to that at, at again the second time around as a nice interrupter. Definitely. Um, and it, yeah. if I can just add in there, I think, Kerry, I think it was Kerry just said in the chat, it also depends on what emotion, what say. body language you add to it. And it does completely. Um, and you can also, if you've got, a new puppy in the house for example and it doesn't yet know the leave command but it's about to pick up and chew your computer cable then you can use that interrupter yeah. just to help it stop in its track slightly so we're also using it for the dog's safety in some cases we can't say leave it like we could to an older dog that we'd already taught that command to because that young puppy doesn't yet know it but we can use it just for the puppy to then go oh sorry oh yeah, okay, I'm focused on you now, let's go and play. And then I've sort of forgotten about the computer cable that I was about to chew on. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, next one is a clap, which I know lots of people use for very different things as, as well as interrupters. I know lots of people that use them for recall and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what people think of a clap, whether it's a, posit uh, a nice or an aversive. <laughs> Pens, pens. <laughs> Aversive to mine. Okay, brilliant. It's nice that people are starting to say what it is to their own dog as well, because it actually means that you're starting to really think about how it affects your own dog and whether it's actually scary or nice to them. Fab. Okay, so yeah, same, very, very similar again. If you've always clapped and I know um, my mum's got pups at the moment and um, they clap before they put the food down um, yeah. so to get the pup attention and get them all up and, and moving and things like that. So to them, a clap will always be a positive because it means food. It's almost like ringing a bell for them to be like dinner time. Um, whereas some dogs you could clap and, and again, noise sensitivity will make them absolutely terrified of that clap and they'll run a mile from you. Um, and yeah, again, Kerry, yeah, you can add emotion to a clap as well. You, you can clap and, and change your body language for it to be a, an aversive interrupter as to stop doing that, or it can be a clap to actually pay attention and come back to me. I like what Philly said. Mine would have, <laughs> mine would have seen it as a round of applause for being silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, repetitive whistling, what do we think of that? Nice or aversive? 
by repetitive whistling we mean like repeating the three pips on the whistle like over and over again or to get attention and things like that okay annoying <laughs> <laughs> I think that in our in our preview of what we were doing on tonight the whistle is broken I like this <laughs> We should have done prizes for these answers, you know. <laughs> Waste of time encouraging this dog to ignore the handler. Okay, fab. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that's the thing. It does. It becomes very, very white noise to the dog. It can be cut, become confusing. Um, so yeah, I think it can be very nice. Um, I've done some kind of guided retrieving where we're constantly blowing the whistle to get the dog to understand to come in, but there's gaps obviously between it. Um, to, to teach obviously a dog to come in handler frustration I love that <laughs> please come back <laughs> All right. um, uh, but yeah and I think it can be and it depends on obviously how you teach it with all of it or with all of the commands um you obviously heavily use commands when you're teaching and then when you're training some of those commands drop off so for me I'd expect as soon as my dogs have got a retrieve I shouldn't need to recall them because they know by that point that are that as soon as something's in their mouth they immediately come back into to me um but yeah i think re repetitive whistling although we're talking about not necessarily whether it works or doesn't work but whether it is nice to the dog or aversive to the dog whether it works or not at this point sort of um not really the point um but it does it work as an interrupter i don't know some dogs yes some dogs no but is it nice or aversive to that dog some dogs, yes, 100%, it will help them understand what's being expected of them and come in. And some dogs, it will be aversive, not because they choose to ignore it, but because they're very noise sensitive and actually it scares them. And it doesn't make them want to come into you because you're making a hell of a lot of racket blowing a whistle at them. Um, so again, it's how you introduce it um, to, to the dog. Pet corrector. nobody's nobody's dead comment yet <laughs> <laughs> okay a verse, so a pet corrector for anybody that doesn't know is a you can get it in you can buy them they're like tins of of kind of what are they like pressure basically that when you it goes press like, air. It's compressed yeah, air. Compressed air, that was it that's what i'm looking for claire thanks um <laughs> It, when you squeeze it or press the button, it basically makes a very, very loud noise. Um, or you can get like uh, stones in a bottle, that kind of thing. Um, often they are used to interrupt a dog maybe jumping up or barking or something like that. Um, and I'm assuming that's why we're getting a lot of aversives and no, don't ever use them. Um, and again, Cindy would be an aversive, but I guess you can pair it with something positive. Um, and actually, right. I'm going to just hand over to Claire to just talk about that a little bit more as well. We've got a, ded a dedicated slide for Pet Corrector in a minute, but yeah, I'll let, I'll let Claire talk about it now quickly. Yeah, so like with anything, it's all about how it's paired. And um, I actually carry one out on walks um, in case I get an aggressive dog come at my dog. So I have desensitized my own dog to the pet corrector so that I have a means. I've probably used it on a human as well if I needed to. <laughs> Not that they'd be particularly bothered by a puff of air. Um, but it's all about perspective on how you use these things and having a dog that has been attacked personally and wanting to protect my own dog with all of these things, you can actually, um, desensitize your own dog, pair it with something good, um, so that you can use it effectively for other methods. But that goes, uh, we're going to talk about the tin can, aren't we later with the, the biscuit tin. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, that goes on nicely so um tin can what do people think so it's very similar to a pet corrector it's obviously just one that you can kind of make at home so cindy just said i know someone who used to yes. teach a recall dog. so yeah it and it's yeah. things like and we won't go too much into it because we have got another slide on it but again these kind of correctors and tin cans although they are commonly used as an aversive to prevent a behavior in yeah exactly um by essa the aversive by manner of use they're commonly used to prevent dogs doing behaviors that you don't want them to do they're used as a deterrent rather than an interrupter 
Um, but actually, if paired in the correct way to the dog and introduced in the correct way to a dog, they can actually be quite a nice interrupter as well and can really, really help some dogs as well. The last one, a very, very controversial one, e-collar. Remember, guys, an e-collar has a vibrate mode and an electric mode on there. Um, so I, it'd be interesting to see what people think, whether this is nice or aversive. Yeah. Okay. The vibration can be more aversive to a shock. For some dogs, the vibration's fine. Aversive, but again, the vibrate mode could help. Um, vibrate color with a, with a deaf dog, no trouble once paired with food, never the electric. I'm thinking of having a vibrate for my deaf dog. Okay, brilliant. So that brings us on to an e-collar. Um, so I have used an e-collar on the vibrate mode. I haven't used one on the electric mode. Um, to teach a client with a deaf dog um and about it we used it basically for recall but then we actually branched out into actually different bits as well um so we paired it very similar to a clicker but obviously the dog can't hear a clicker can't hear a whistle um so firstly we did um a very similar method to muzzle training to actually place the collar on the dog so that the dog is happy having the collar on um, we didn't actually put it right around the dog's neck to start with. We just put it right up against the skin, um, without it actually being tied on, um, and just vibrated it on a very, very low setting. And every time we vibrated, we treated, um, and then what we started to do was we started to leave the collar on in the house all the time without any vibrating happening or anything like that, just so that the dog became very accustomed, accustomed to the collar being on. Um, and it took a long time before we actually started using the vibrate mode. And every single time we used the vibrate, it was at very, very close proximity. It was one vibrate and a treat instantly. Um, that single vibrate very quickly became a sit whistle or very similar to a stop. Um, and three vibrates then very quickly became a recall. Um, and the dog actually ended up being able to still work. It was a gun dog that was near retirement, but still had a bit of drive in him. Um, but unfortunately, had gone deaf and he still carried on working because they could recall him. They could stop him. When he stopped, he looked for them and then he could be redirected. Um, and he could, he just didn't range too far that he didn't, he went out of sight and things like that. So, but he could still actually work, um, for, for his owner quite nicely. Um, so just showing, I know it's not on the electric mode, um, but it is on the vibrate that actually, if you pair it with something, um, nice to the dog, that piece of equipment saved that dog having to go into an early retirement and making life very difficult and on a lead for the rest of its life when it had been a working gun dog. Um, but also kept that relationship with its owner um, being able to work in the field as well. So just shows that not necessarily, I know e-collars are a huge topic that we won't even attempt to branch into in mass detail tonight because they're a different, it's a completely different um, way of training and one that I don't think any of us have used an e-collar on the electric mode. Um, I think a lot of, some of us have used them on the vibrate mode, but not on the electric either. So um but just to go into a little bit of detail about them, um, an e-collar is predominantly seen as a positive uh, punishment. So it's adding something to reduce a behavior. So you add the shock to reduce a bad recall is, is the common way, usually in the UK, that they're actually used for. Um, so it's a dog with very high prey drive that chases deer or livestock or anything like that. And they're shocked to tell them to come back. Um, obviously, that may or may not work for that dog. Um, but... And there are obviously other methods that you could prevent prey drive and things like that from happening as well. Um, but just to add on to that, the other method of teaching a dog to not obviously chase livestock and come back to you and things like that is also another positive punishment, um, which is adding a long line and a, and a harness um, to a dog as well, because you're still adding equipment to, to reduce the bad recall. Um, they can be used though as both a positive punishment and a negative reinforcement, okay, based on your timing of use. So they can be used to add a shock 
until a good behavior is seen and then the shock is removed, okay? So you would add the shock until the dog stops running after something and then the shock's removed, okay? Um, so that's how they're used in both of those two quadrants, just as an example, okay? We're not obviously telling anybody that they need to use an e-collar or they should use an e-collar. We're just telling you as a, as a, from the science terms, what quadrant they fit under the e-collar okay again if you paired an e-collar with a verbal marker of food um you're obviously using it as a positive reinforcement because you're adding something to increase a behavior so when i talked about the, de the deaf dog that had an e-collar paired with marker with a verb with with food um for a recall you're obviously using it um as a positive reinforcement um because that dog learned to have a better recall um because of the shock okay or because of the vibrate and using noise to train um so depending on the training methods um a noise or like what we were talking about with the interrupters um is actually a positive punishment and that goes all the way down to a clicker um because you're adding something so you're adding a piece of equipment to um sorry add, a, add in a piece of equipment okay um so a positive punishment rattle to interrupt a behavior and then reward but it can also be a positive reinforcement adding something to increase a behavior and this is what claire's going to talk about now yeah absolutely so this was um we spent quite a lot of time talking about this didn't we when we the yeah. three of us were were discussing all of this um because um noise interrupt can actually be very beneficial for some dogs um if the owner's voice has become like white noise and we're not talking about frightening the dog we're not talking about scaring the dog or being harsh but sometimes a noise whether that be a clap or whether that be um the uh, uh, or whatever it is the the tin can is one of those the pet corrector could be deemed of one of those um, it's a noise that up uh, the owner's word like a uh, so that the owner can then give them something good to do to reward the dog however <laughs> all of those things can be paired with something really good so if you took for example something like um, the tin can the rattle can but somebody has been using a tin box of treats or biscuits to call their dog in from the garden well, what you've got there is something very, very, very nice. Nearly used the wrong word then, guys. Something very nice. Um, what the dog hears that noise and pairs it with something really exciting. I come in and I, and I get these cookies out of this tin. So we really have to look at the training methods behind how any piece of equipment is used or applied and how the dog will deem that based on the history of the dog, the relationship with the owner, the personality of the dog, which is why we said at the beginning, like this, this specific webinar is to talk about the science behind it and how things can be used as opposed to saying, this is what you should use, because it will always depend on the way it's introduced and on the personality of the dog, the history of the dog, the history of the relationship between and the owner as well. And that's really important to remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, it is on really nicely, Claire, to like the appropriate use of all these four quadrants when you're training. And hopefully um, now we've kind of given everybody that's watching tonight, um, basically the, that all of these quadrants can be used in a nice way or an aversive way, depending on the dog that's in front of you and how you pair it um, and, and what you pair it with, basically. Um, so on that, I just want to see if anybody in the chat box is, is happy enough to kind of, if they want to, just give us any kind of thoughts that have maybe changed their mind on certain bits of equipment or how they would train and use different bits of equipment um, before we go on to any kind of live questions and I'll stop sharing the screen for that. Well, Becky is just typed, which is basically what you've just said, Emma, but a, uh, a clicker is a condition reinforcer and is a neutral stimulus though. But anything is, new, is neutral until we pair it. Um, you know, that's what Emma was just described. Whatever that thing is, and it depends how it's introduced and how it's paired and what it's followed up with. 
um, is whether the dog will deem that nice or not. So like if you just did a clicker and nothing else happened, depending on the dog in front of you, because they've never heard that noise before, if you've got mm. a very confident dog, they might, they might find it quite a nice noise and not be that bothered by it. But if you've got a very noise sensitive dog, a clicker with nothing after it could be a very scary noise to them. And the same with a tin can or a pet corrector, but it's how we then pair it that then falls into these quadrants. So if you clicked and then did something that was harsh to the dog or aversive, it would fall into a different quadrant. If you did something, if you paired something then with something nice, it would then fall into a different quadrant, if that makes sense. That's so, nice, Flo. Um, we've had a couple of comments there. Um, there was a comment just, oh, I've gone too far. Where did it go? <laughs> Something about a golden is it retriever. The, this is confirmed about the challenges I had with my rescue golden retriever. Um, I had no idea what his learning history was. The rescue had no history on his previous life. Lots of things I viewed I was being nice and he saw as aversive. Yeah, and I think that's that's really interesting as well is, is when you get a dog that you don't actually have any history of, what you may deem as actually, oh, I'm being really nice, I'm trying to be nice to them, they may actually see as, as a really scary thing um, or something that's that's really aversive and it's not actually... You're not doing it deliberately. Um, it's it's just that dog that's in front of you. And what Becky has said, so Becky has said, but a clicker is a predictor of reward or punishment, not a reward or punishment. So it doesn't fit into the quadrant. The fact that you're adding the clicker means it has to be in one of the two positive quadrants. Uh, because you're adding a piece of equipment or you're adding something in. And then that's what we've said before about how many things can cross over between the two quadrants, because you can either use it to increase a behavior. So you could use the clicker and the reward to increase or speed up the speed of a sit. Um, or you could use the clicker to bring the dog's focus back to you and stop it disappearing off after the pheasant. So you're, you're then decreasing the behavior of it running off after the pheasant. So it's, it could be a, I've got to, hang on. It could be a positive reinforcer or it could be a positive punishment. Yeah. Right. Flo's just said, very informative and open to me to be non-judgmental until you actually understand how people are pairing their training. That That's lovely, Flo. That, that's great, which is really what we were trying achieve tonight as well <laughs> uh, and then Esther said I really like the way you use the e-collar for death I always thought of it as a big no but it actually could be used as a positive enforcer yeah Bob has said um, I'm having trouble scrolling guys sorry <laughs> <laughs> I think shooting up and down like this I'm like oh <laughs> help what did Bob say? Where's Bob gone? Have you there? got it? So I Bob guess... said, I guess, sorry, you go. No, it's okay. I've, I've, I've no, just so okay. To <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Bob no, said, Bob. I guess we need to balance the use of each quadrant relative to our doing, our dog. Um, and exactly that. Yeah. And that's what we sort of wanted to get across in that because the words negative and positive are used, but actually they're not seen as to how they were meant in the first place, which is why I think it's important, you know, negative literally just means taking something away and positive literally just means adding something in. Um, and it is exactly that, finding that balance and finding what your dog needs, what you need and reading all the body language um, and the scenarios and everything as well and using what applies best to your dog in that particular scenario at that particular moment in time rather than getting too caught up on the fact that the word negative and punishment is used because it's not actually a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, Em, back to you. No, Louise has just written, um, it feels like all the methods are so relevant. The trick is knowing what works 
what works best for the dog in front of you I think that's the biggest challenge the worry is doing something to correct and inadvertently causing an aversive or she's written negative I'm assuming she means aversive for the dog um I'm reminded of what you said earlier about whether the dog actually understands the command as well and that's a, that's another big key message as well is actually if you need to correct you also then have to look back, does my dog understand? Because if I've had to correct, is my dog choosing to do wrong because something else is more exciting or the environment is more stimulating or whatever the, the pull is to do some, to choose to do wrong? But equally, have you actually chose, have you actually taught them to choose the right one, the right method, the right training bit that you want them to do, the right behavior? Because if you haven't actually taught them the right behavior, you can't expect them to choose right. And even when they choose wrong, they're not necessarily choosing wrong. They're just making a choice. Um, so it's really important to, although we've obviously spent a lot of time on these quadrants, to actually go right back to the first slides that we, we showed you guys and actually think about the teaching versus training. And you shouldn't need to use correction when you are teaching um but correction will need to be used when you are training and it's then looking at right how do i correct do i use positive reinforcements do i use positive punishments do i use negative reinforcements or do i need to use negative punishments and we've gone through two examples of all of them that are deemed as nice but again a harness in a long line might be terrifying for a dog and that is a positive punishment um and equally there's there's other methods as well that you could use that could be very really scary to a dog that actually you think are quite nice um so it's just again thinking about the dog that's in front of you um i agree and i think the thing is you know i think people have become afraid to use the word correction and afraid that correction is, is such a negative thing you know and and it's like if the dog has learned it if you don't like the word correction education <laughs> you know for me I talk a lot you know I, I educate my dogs all the time as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate um and and we do that for their safety and I, and I think you know that's the thing it's looking at what you're doing and you're doing it for the safety and the well-being of your dog at the end of the day so a couple of people have asked about lead checks so a lead check um may be nice or aversive depending on how the dog responds to it um in terms of the science side of it it's technically a positive punishment because you're adding the check on the lead to reduce the behavior of the dog pulling um so from that point of view that's what quad quadrant it fits into whether your dog can or cannot cope with it is totally dependent on that dog and that's why we touched at the start saying that we're not going to obviously offer advice of whether you should or shouldn't do these or should or shouldn't use them. Um, we are just here tonight to show you that all four of these quadrants can be used as effectively and in a nice way, depending on obviously the dog that's in front of you. So some dogs tolerate a lead, a slip lead and a lead correction very, very well. And if your timing's correct, it will have a very good impact on heel work. And some dogs absolutely melt to the ground and can refuse to walk and find it very, very stressful um, and very aversive, in which case you'd be looking at a different method of heel work training. Um, so it's that, again, is, is not kind of what we were here to describe tonight is whether you should or shouldn't lead correct. It was more that this is, this is where it falls into in a science-based way should you or should you not use it is dependent on the dog in front of you and, and what you're comfortable training and what the dog can tolerate as well. I had a, I had a feeling that the lead thing was going to come up tonight because it's such a common one, isn't it? You know, because dogs pull on a lead. Uh, and, I, and I actually, what you've just said, Em, and, and I actually wrote down what you've just said and I, I actually wrote, but that neg you know, if, um, if you take away the pressure of the lead, then the dog is responding to the pressure in a di because the dog's responding to that in a, in a distracting place. So it's whether the dog deems the correction, the pressure on or the pressure off <laughs> as yeah. the nice or not nice. <laughs> yeah, because obviously the pressure, the pressure coming off is a negative reinforcement. Uh, Correct. Because you're obviously taking the pressure away to increase the, the likelihood of the dog staying at heel. 
but your pressure on of your lead check is your positive punishment. Yeah. So the timing of those obviously fall into, into two quadrants. And, and that's why we wanted to come on tonight and, ex and explain this because lots of people misuse the word positive and negative and they see it as nice or aversive. Um, and they don't know probably enough about these quadrants to be able to know whether what they're doing is nice or aversive. Um, so hopefully that's kind of what we've, what we've given everybody tonight. Nadine uh, has said, yes, education, brilliant. <laughs> and Esther has said, timing and method of use and of every tool. So key to understand our training, Skinner and Pavlos remain with us. <laughs> It's also, someone said further up, and I can't remember who it was, um, but they'd said uh, also about sort of emotions and body language and tone of voice. So not only have we got the adding and the removal of pieces of equipment, but we do have to um, use our being into those quadrants as well. So we can add a good or a, um, uh, I can't think of the word I want, not good. <laughs> tone just you know we can even without saying anything we can be both nice and aversive um so whoever it was that said it Kerry I think it was that said it it is exactly that you've you've, you've got the four quadrants but we can put ourselves in those quadrants as well and as we've said earlier girls it's it's understanding what those four quadrants mean and having a clear picture in your own mind to then be able to apply it to the situation in front of you and the dog in front of you as well. Correct. I've just scrolled up and um, Becky said, does this method cross into creating neural pathways? Um, so I'll just touch a little bit about neural pathways. Um, so obviously anytime you do something, um, you're trying to create a behavior pattern. Anytime you want to teach them a new method, you'd create a behavior pattern and any of the quadrants that you decide to use, will create that behavior pattern if you are consistently doing it over and over and over again at the right time with the dog behaving in the correct way or the, the way that you want them to behave over and over again. So all four of these quadrants, if used consistently, um, depending on obviously what you're teaching and what you're trying to achieve, will create a neural pathway of some description, whether that's nice or aversive. I hope that kind of understand, that answers what yeah. you said. Um, so oh, Louise, oh. you, you very much achieved that. I never thought I would see an e-collar being used in a positive way. It's amazing how we are unconsciously judgmental about equipment or methods. Our intentions are the difference that make the difference. Oh, I really like that. Our intentions are the difference that make the difference. I might steal that, Louise, if you don't mind. I really like that sentence. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll just stop sharing so that we can see everybody. Um, but if anybody does actually have any questions, they don't have to put them in the chat box. They can just raise their hand on the reactions bit and come off mute um, and just ask any questions that they want to if they want to bearing in mind we're not doing we're not giving advice of what you should do with your dog tonight that was not the idea of um of the presentation so if you've got any specific dog issues um maybe save them for dog and duck or um one of the like message one of the trainers or something afterwards as well um, just so that we can delve into it in a little bit more detail. So, but if anybody's got any questions on the PowerPoint or the science behind it or what we've talked about tonight, then we're happy to answer them. <laughs> I think, Em, you've sort of like blown blown up, up, as Claire, Emma and Sam, you've blown our minds a little bit. Like I was making notes as you were talking about this, because as I said at the start, this has been baffling me okay am i a positive trainer am i not a positive trainer what type of trainer am i do i know what i'm doing most of the time i don't but for, i've got far more clarity now about what i'm actually thinking and what i'm talking about when i'm talking about positive and negative and i think i do far more appreciate the use of the words nice and averse i don't know if everybody else agrees with me you can nod along with me if you want because you can see you all um or they can see us all it's far a clear, far clearer for me to understand, am I a nice trainer or am I an aversive trainer? And I can use that in my terminology and allow myself to be less judgmental of what others are doing because I can agree that people shouldn't be aversive with their dogs, 
but then I don't need to get involved in whether what they're doing is positive or negative. Does that make sense, everyone? I, it's, it's made me think, well, actually, what are my, what are my thoughts about all this? Um, and hopefully, if we all now start thinking about nice or aversive, it'll give us all a little bit more clarity about, about what it is we're trying to achieve or what others are trying to achieve. Um, for anybody else who's on here, the, the featured experts have just done a fantastic job, I think, for most of us uh, of giving clarity. Can you put in the chat, or if you want to comment, does anybody want to comment on what they've talked about or how it's changed what you think? Any hands up or do you want to write it in the chat and we can read them from the chat? I know a lot of people feel more confident in the chat. In the chat. Um, I mean, I don't mind sharing with everybody that the three of us spent two and a half hours brainstorming for tonight, the other night. Like, we were thrashing out everything. Like, <laughs> it was an incredible conversation. And at the end, we went, we should have recorded that. That's what we said. We said we should have recorded that. <laughs> And played that because it was just three trainers like just going right for it. It was it was an amazing night. We were very and, tired by the end. <laughs> and it's great well, I that. didn't string a sentence together by the end of it. It's lovely to see though for you for, for you you are trainers. You are experienced trainers. We value your input quite you know so so much. It's not true. If you are taking two and a half hours, you know, going through this. For the rest of us, that's, I think that's where the baffling side of it comes from, is that if we don't have that level of expertise, is, is working on what we're trying to do. And even just going back to that presentation, looking at where you've like put up the examples, I know they are going to be massively valuable to, to us. I know as well, some people said, thank you for making it free. We wanted to make this free for a, for a reason, okay? We wanted to make the clarity and help people understand it not just in our society members group but across the whole group because we really do think this is a massively important topic of conversation so it really really will help us after this if you are on social media if you are on facebook if you're on uh, instagram whatever just to like tag us tag the lwdg tag uh, one of the trainers and share that content because then what your thoughts were because then we can then reshare that for you and show people that almost like starting a movement of getting people to think a little bit further like one of the um lovely people who've been right in just said something about you know mind stretching and that's what we want to do we want to stretch your minds to start thinking about what it is we are saying is the reality of the situation we're in now because a lot of people are confused, as I've said many times, but we need to start breaking that confusion down. We're going to continue them as well. So in July, there will be another free webinar. So keep an eye out for that. We blew through the 100. We only get 100 people onto our webinars. We've blown through it. So a lot of people didn't get on the, on here tonight, which is, is very unfortunate. Um, but what we will do because of that, Society members, you will get this recording free tomorrow. It will be put up. I will make sure it's ready for you. It'll be in there as this month's masterclass, along with another masterclass we've got this month. So you're going to have lots of master masterclasses. For everybody else, I know you're going to want to go back and see it. We'll put it up as what's called a pick and mix. So keep an eye out in the free group. A pick and mix basically means you can access just this one masterclass if you want to. Enrollment is open for society members today, and I know loads of you have joined. So if you want to join as a society member, you can do that, or you will have access to this as a pick and mix. Um, so I hope that helps anybody who's thinking, how can I go back? How can I go back through the slides? How can I see the examples again? Um, Em, back to you. Yeah, Bob's got a question. All right. I'm going to raise the hand. Oh, and come off, come off mute. First of all, I feel like a bit of an imposter, so thank you for letting me join in. <laughs> Well, I will say my wife is here with me as well, actually. <laughs> uh, so uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, uh, yeah, we, we've been, um, we've had dogs for over 30 years. And I've seen over that period, training techniques change. If you go back 30 years ago, whoa, aversive was just the norm. You know, some of the techniques that were used were quite, quite brutal. Um, I've recently got into gun dog training, hence I'm here. Uh, and I've read um, uh, some really, really interesting books. And the, the full quadrants is explained in one of those books. I had to read it several times to get it. You've just explained it, I think, exceptionally well, exceptionally clearly. And the two and a half hours that you've you put together, guys, I think was a thank you for the investment because I think it's been really worthwhile. Because I think what you've done there is actually bring out some massively important points about how to 
look at what's going on with your dog and yourself and work out what's the best way to handle a situation, take something away, add something in, etc. So, so thanks for that. That I think it was just exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> I and also that. some of these comments are stunningly like, stunningly? I don't know. That, that's not going to make sense. They're just lovely. Thank you. Honestly, thank you guys. When I, when I studied the quadrants at uni, um, cause I, I, I they, we did a three hour session on it and how the quadrants affect learning and neural pathways and things like that afterwards. And, um, it, the three hour lecture, I came away going, I don't know if I actually understand this. Um, so even, even for me doing it, it was, um, I mean, both of the, all three of us have got like pages and pages of notes. Yeah, and honestly. <laughs> and I was sending these guys notes from homework from my studies. <laughs> and I was like, I just did that. I just dug out this. And it, I think we've just made it sound more sensible now than I did back then. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, the four, the four quadrants have obviously been around for, for years and years and years um, and have gone through all of the change of training over those years as well um, and are still relevant to all of um, those those changes as, as training's got nicer and less aversive. Um, but they're not always an easy thing to understand. And I think lots of people miss misuse the words positive and negative when actually they mean nice or aversive. Um, which meant that the four quadrants lost their meaning and people thought, well, if I'm not a positive trainer, then I shouldn't be training and things like that. If I'm not positive in my training methods, when actually that word isn't even the right word to be using, it should be, am I a nice trainer? Um, and we did look for ages for a different word than nice um, because aversive is quite a sciencey word and we were trying desperately to find a more sciencey word for the nice bit um and subversive just didn't seem to fit so we we went with nice but i think that, <laughs> that's the, that's the bit that threw a lot of people um is that positive is now positive and negative are being used in the wrong way um when you're talking about training um, well, I, I don't know about the rest of these ladies but, and gentlemen, Bob. I'm sure they would agree with us, though. But I, you know, I would like to think I'm a nice trainer, and I would like to go and see a nice trainer. So I think it's a, pro a completely appropriate word for understanding how that trainer is going to treat me and treat my dog. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we just wanted to be very, very neutral about it. This is not. Um, this was not an easy webinar to to put together um so it, yeah we wanted to make sure that we were very balanced and scientific and informative rather than throwing our opinions into it because that's not what yeah. it that's not helpful um no. our opinion of what we would do with one dog it would be totally different to what we would do with another dog um so we wanted to really focus on the science and the terminology of it to explain it to everybody so they can make their own decisions with their own dogs in front of them um and their own decision about a trainer when they go and see them as well. Is that trainer a nice trainer? Even though they're using all four quadrants, are they actually nice or are they using them, them, them aversively? Well, Alison has written, this is why I'm an LWDG member. You guys may think I've heard about for years, just so much clearer and easier to understand. It's the best monthly membership I have. Thank you. Um, that's, that's, that's massive. That, that makes the featured experts day. I know I could see them all smiling. Um, right. I'm going to... Uh, Emma, are you going to close us out tonight? Are you going to press? No, 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 I'll, make, I'll, no, I'll swap it over. Hang oh, on. Swap it <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for watching tonight as well, because like this is a huge subject and I want to just thank everybody for coming on and watching tonight because we've had a lot of people watching and it's really nice that so many people have come on. So thank you. Lovely. Thank you all. I, I was thinking you... that as well, actually. Joe, if I can just I second completely what Claire just said it's been an honor actually to be you know part with Claire and, and Emma and trying to make it slightly clearer for everyone um Joe you said earlier that you had sort of had trouble working out which quadrant was what etc cetera, etc cetera. we three did as well the other night when we were training we know what the four quadrants are and we know what the definitions is and we know what they mean but we were still throwing ideas and examples back and forth and one of us would say well no that's a positive reinforcement and the other one would say well actually is it because it might be a negative punishment <laughs> then. so you know for three people that train dogs all day every day we still had to sit back and go right we've got to compartmentalize this bit here 
<laughs> so good luck everybody but hopefully we have made it clearer for you yeah you, def you definitely have I definitely feel again I don't think I can be honest with you you've definitely made me understand what they mean what they actually physically mean um, and that's a massive thing in itself so everybody who's on the webinar all those who didn't manage to get on we will send you an email tomorrow with the links to where you need to go if you want to access it again whether you're a society member or you're, you go through the pick and mix route, you will have permanent access to it. So don't think, oh, I've got to watch it really, really quickly. You'll be able to watch it over and over and over and over again, okay? Um, I'm, Emma's passed um, control back to me now so that I get to pull the funny face when I'm ending it. I'd like to give a big round of applause. You can come off mute if you want. And um, I'll give a big round of applause to the ladies because I think you absolutely nailed it as I would think you would because you are absolutely brilliant and um for everybody thank you for your time we really do appreciate it we hope you come along to our next webinar um, and we hope to see you soon have a lovely evening all good night thank you bye. thank you bye, bye. bye.